Welcome to another one of our Bruce Group interviews, where we speak to different voices on the challenges Britain and the wider world face today. I'm Christopher Lin, and I'm an author and contributor with the Bruce Group. And today I have the privilege of hearing from one of Canada's most prominent and foremost, and foremost statesmen and voices in economic and foreign policy, the Honorable John Manley. John Manley is Canada's former Deputy Prime Minister and has served in other high profile roles in cabinet, such as Finance Minister, Foreign Affairs Minister, and Industry Minister in the cabinet of Liberal Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. Mr. Manley was elected Member of Parliament for Ottawa South in 1988 and retired in 2004. And in his role as Foreign Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, he was praised for his steadfast response to 9 11 terror attacks, piloting anti terrorism legislation through the Canadian Parliament. Um, and easing Canada-US relations. In the words of the head of a Toronto think tank, under Manley, the government of Canada talks to Washington, not at it. As industry minister, he sought to combat Canada's brain drain, support Canada's technological development, and increase technology use in Canadian schools. John Manley is a lawyer by profession, having been called to the Ontario Bar in 1978, and serves as a senior advisor at law firm Bennett Jones. He holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics and political science from Carleton University and a Juris Doctor from the University of Ottawa, having graduated summa cum laude and as a gold medalist. Mr. Manley, thank you for speaking to us. My pleasure. Um, Mr. Manley, I, I'd like to start with what I guess is one of the international community's greatest concerns at present. Um, with the 31st of August deadline just having passed, um, that is Afghanistan. Um, do you think that the, um, the Canadian government has done, did enough to evacuate Canadian subjects, Afghan interpreters, and others at risk? I think they were slow to react. Um, I think we've known since uh, President Trump negotiated with the Taliban some time ago, and then in April of this year, President Biden confirmed uh, their, the U.S. decision to pull out of Afghanistan. I think there was ample time to make uh, um, efforts to get uh, Canadian um, aids, translators, their families, uh, fixers, and so on out of Afghanistan. And I think instead of doing so, recognizing the importance of, of uh, uh, acting within the time frame that was left, um, instead, the government tended to be very bureaucratic, uh, sending people lengthy forms in English, expecting responses and documents and so on that might make sense in ordinary times, but in this case, simply frustrated the process of, of extracting uh, people who had served Canada from uh, that uh, very dangerous zone in a timely fashion. Yes, I recall that I think on the CBC they were talking about there was um, something to do with a sort of evacuee support group who was saying oh, France was setting up, sending out buses, Germany was doing this, and Canada is sending out emails. So I think that very much does echo the sort of sentiment you're um, laying up. And I guess looking at the sort of entire period of the Canadian forces presence in Afghanistan and your own role, um, be it with the Manly Report on Afghanistan in 2007, as well as um, foreign minister during 9-11 and the invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, do you believe that this situation could have been avoided? Well, there, there are many things that, that could have been done differently for sure. Um, I think it's important, a couple of things that are important for everyone to remember. First of all, Afghanistan was on our radar screen before 9-11. Um, uh, the uh, Taliban regime had drawn the attention of the global community, both with its brutal ruthlessness uh, toward women in particular, but, uh, but other minority groups, uh, uh, some of the Shia um, uh, communities within Afghanistan and Bamiyan and in the north, um, and uh, with their destruction of the ancient Buddhas in the Bamiyan Valley. Uh, this, this had become noteworthy, and it was a point of concern uh, that this was also um, a lawless frontier where terrorists, particularly Al-Qaeda, Al were, being, were being given refuge. I know that they were warned as early as the Clinton administration that uh, after the USS Cole um, incident, uh, 
that if anything were to emanate from Afghanistan to damage US interests, that there would be a significant price to pay. So when 9-11 occurred, it wasn't, it wasn't out of nowhere. Uh, there, was, there was a tension on that regime. But I would say the initial foray into Afghanistan was not intended as an invasion at all. It was intended as an effort to disable Al Qaeda from further attacks following 9-11. Canadian forces were there virtually from the beginning in support of the US efforts in an attempt to find Osama bin Laden and to disable Al Qaeda's capacity to cause trouble. We were meeting as I recall, as GA foreign ministers in New York in uh, November 2001, during the uh, somewhat delayed UN General Assembly of that year, when the Taliban fled from Kabul as Northern Alliance forces moved in. And that was the point at which necessarily the mission changed from one of disabling Al Qaeda to one of trying to find a way to provide some form of, of uh, reliable governance for a very large territory, uh, a very large and mountainous territory in Central Asia. And I think there was a general acceptance at the time of the need for some support. I think, Christopher, where things began to go haywire was actually two years later when the United States invaded Iraq and um, the focus moved from Afghanistan, which had been very much, you might call it a, a humanitarian effort to that point. Uh, it, it wasn't heavy fighting. The Taliban had withdrawn. Um, and it was after the invasion of Iraq that the Taliban began infiltrating back in in numbers um, from Pakistan and, uh, and causing disruption in, um, in, the, in the area. So, I, I, you know, could things have turned out differently? Um, my own view is that uh, um, the West attempted to establish a, dem a democratic form of government in a country that had not develop the institutional framework for that, um, uh, was, uh, had put aside some of the effort around uh, feeding and providing medical support for the Afghan population, tried to create a kind of federal state when uh, the tribal influences were very strong and very poorly understood in the West. There were many things that perhaps, you know, in hindsight, we could have done differently. But I think it's important also to acknowledge that over the course of 20 years, many, many women have been educated. Uh, many Afghans have been able to create uh, businesses and develop uh, international relationships. Afghanistan was emerging, obviously not an advanced state, it was a poor state, uh, will be for many years to come, but, but progress was being made and it was, has been kind of overtaken by the violence and by the decision by the US to, to withdraw. Okay, um, I, I, I kind of see what you mean. It's sort of saddening when you look at the sort of pictures of 1970s Kabul before the Soviet invasion and think how much has happened since um, and how much will happen in the, come, in the years to come. Um, yeah, I guess you're sort of turning to um, issue more domestic Canadian issues and something that surprisingly is on many British minds, especially with us in the Bruges group, um, the 44th Canadian federal election. Um, I guess, and, and this kind of does relate to Afghanistan. Um, do you believe that Justin Trudeau does have a good chance of getting a majority, the majority that he was vying for? back in September, back, uh, um, in September. Um, or um, I guess following up on that, do you think an O'Toole government, be it in the minority or be it a majority is possible? And I guess we have to understand for British viewers that in the past there have been minority liberal governments, be it Lester Pierce and Paul Martin, or um, even Pierre Trudeau, I think for two years, but they've only lasted two years. Um, do correct me if I'm wrong, just to add some context. No, that's right, but uh, I, I think uh, what's unique here is that uh, 
certainly as, as the response to the COVID pandemic became the key issue, um, Mr. Trudeau had no difficulty getting any of his COVID measures through Parliament. Um, he has called an election, although he was, his government did not lose a confidence motion in the House of Commons. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think where his campaign has perhaps faltered out, the, out of the gate is that he has been uh, having difficulty explaining why, uh, well, COVID, uh, the fourth wave is ongoing, well, uh, the Canadian government should be preoccupied with extracting um, people from Afghanistan, that um, uh, he's decided to call an election. And I, I, you know, I, I, you ask the horse race question, and that's always a treacherous one to answer. And, and British viewers will understand mm -hmm. why it's complicated in a multi-party first-past-the-post system to ever really know uh, very far in advance what's going to happen. Something Americans don't usually understand because <laughs> the, with a two-party system. Uh, the, the polling can give you some indications. Also, I think polling has become a little less reliable given uh, given the propensity for people just to simply not answer their phones anymore. So, so I, 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 I hesitate to answer the horse race question except to say uh, a little over two weeks into the campaign, to me, it's very difficult to see a majority uh, emerging from this. Uh, for either the Liberals or the Conservatives. Um, I don't put a lot of stock in the polling numbers, uh, but uh, I think there was a, a sense that this election was about Mr. Trudeau and it wasn't about Canadian people, that he had not succeeded in making the case for why he needed to have an election. And, uh, and I think many Canadians will be hesitant, therefore, to to, to reward him with more seats than he had uh, coming out of the last parliament. Um, how many will shift between, from the Liberals to the Conservatives? Hard to say. Um, it is not impossible that you could have a minority government uh, uh, of either stripe coming out of this. Yes, and I guess you know there's always sort of people who are concerned about oh, what are the seat, what's the seat makeup going to be like in the GTA um, in I think BC and um, Ontario's um, once some of the um, sort of conservative um, conservative bellwether seats or liberal bellwether seats that people are looking at. Um, so I guess we, we can let that play out um, in the coming days and weeks. Um, and I'd like to guess touch on on an issue that sort of um, that that you've been speaking on for a slightly longer period of time. And that does really hit at um, hit back also at the federal election, and that is um, the Meng Wanzhou case, which has been blamed for freezing Canada-China relations. Former Liberal, Conservative, and NDP politicians, diplomats, and jurists, from former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien to former Tory Foreign Minister Lawrence Cannon, Lloyd Axworthy, and Ed Broadbent, among others, have all called on the government to release Meng Wanzhou. Now, you've also personally advocated for a prisoner exchange um, and her release. Um, why do you think that's the case and why do you think that the government is so resistant to do that? Well, I, I think uh, that we know how this will end. It will end with exactly that, whether it's formally an exchange or uh, uh, which I would hope for, because I think that uh, the two Canadians that are wrongly held in China will stay there for quite some time after, after Madame Meng is released, uh, if it's not a formal exchange. Uh, so, for example, if uh, if it happens because the courts, which is not impossible, decide that they uh, refuse to commit her for extradition, um, Canada's really lost all leverage uh, and. Uh, and I think that the two Michaels will probably have to wait a year or more before they are ultimately released. So I, I hope it's an exchange. I do believe that's the only way this is going to end. Um, why uh, the government has been so resistant, I, 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 I just don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I, as you may know, from the very beginning of this incident, I've been insisting that 
somebody should read the Extradition Act uh, because uh, the government was saying, you know, this is Canada's a rule of law country and the courts. Have, and yes, Canada is a rule of law country, but the law consists of not just judges, but also legislation. And in the legislation uh, that uh, governs extradition, uh, it's clearly ultimately a decision of the Attorney General. Uh, even if the court commits Madame Mung for extradition, the Attorney General still has the ability to say no. And uh, I think they should have exercised that power much earlier in the process, um, where, you know, within days of uh, the two Michaels having spent a thousand days in a difficult incarceration in China. Um, Madame Meng is also, of course, approaching a thousand days, but her uh, conditions of incarceration appear to be much more, um, shall we say, comfortable than those of uh, two Michaels. And uh, I, I, I think this uh, didn't need to go this way at all. I, I also thought from the outset uh, that this is an unusual extradition request, uh, given that the alleged offenses are really corporate in nature. It's not normal for uh, the U.S to seek the extradition of an officer of a corporation uh, in this kind of context. Um, and it should have caused alarm bells to go off because Madame Meng has been in other countries. And in fact, in that particular trip was destined for another country which has extradition uh, treaties with the United States. And I think that uh, our, the Canadian government quite frankly was played by the Trump government on this. And, uh, and has uh, fallen into an unfortunate situation that was avoidable. Yes, and I guess this kind of hits on a much broader question because personally I was somewhat surprised that, you know, that the Liberal government um, would maintain this stance, particularly at the time I think a Liberal government in the majority uh, would maintain the stance because my thought was that a Liberal government would be arguably less hawkish, particularly on China issues, and they'd be much more keen um, to listen to um, especially former Liberal cabinet ministers, yourself, um, or Jean Chrétien. Um, and yet there, there have been sort of voices say, say, arguing that maybe then Foreign Minister Christian Freeland's um, supposed hawkism um, and sort of more hawkish approach to China might have influenced things. So I guess then they ask the question, um, as a former foreign minister, as a form, as a former finance and industry minister, um, what do you think would be the right approach to relations to China? Because it is a lingering question um, in the United Kingdom right now. And one could almost say that Afghanistan makes it an even more pertinent one to ask. Well, it certainly does. Uh, first, China has a tiny piece of border with Afghanistan um, and uh, will be anxious to fill uh, whatever void is created there. Um, and uh, Afghanistan doesn't have a lot, but it does have copper and has some rare minerals and a few other things that will be of interest to the Chinese. But also, it's a large territory um, in Central Asia, and China will want to expand its inf influence there. So I think they will play. How, how to manage China? Uh, clearly, the China, the China that we have seen emerge um, now that the, the current leadership has been in place for a period of time is different from the one that we dealt with prior to, to um, a Premier Xi becoming uh, Premier of China. And I think that we um, need to recognize that uh, 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 China is an important player in the world. It's will probably emerge within decades as the largest economy in the world. It's expanding its influence, uh, not just across Asia, but it's using uh, whatever tools it can to try to, to extend its reach. It has been, um, it has, uh, it's, uh, the events in Hong Kong are worrisome. Uh, they don't represent the uh, fulfillment of the undertakings that China had made 
at the time uh, of the transition of government in Hong Kong. Um, so there are, there are lots of warning signals there. I'm though of the belief that, um, you know, for Canada, um, as a middle power, a smaller power, if you like, it doesn't do us any good. We're not, for, we're not fulfilling a purpose in the world if we don't talk to everybody. So uh, I, I, I don't regard diplomatic recognition or diplomatic contact as being some kind of approbation of the behavior uh, or values or attitudes of foreign governments. So I think it's very important for Canada and for Britain to be fully engaged with China. Um, I, I don't think uh, standing on the sidelines wagging our fingers um, uh, is going to make much difference. I think the engagement is what makes a difference. I have the same belief uh, about engaging with, with a regime like, like Iran. Uh, we haven't had diplomatic relations with Iran. We should restore them. We should be talking to the Iranians. Um, I, of all people, I know that the Taliban is a vicious or has in the past been a vicious, anti-democratic, uh, anti-women regime, but we need to talk to them. <laughs> and I, I don't think engagement means approbation. I think engagement is really what is necessary in order to ensure that you've got a voice in the world. In the old, you know, in the in the in in times past, during the Cold War, one of the things that that gave uh, uh, value to Canada's relationship with the United States was that we maintained a presence in Cuba. I use that as an example. And uh, quite frankly, that was not just useful for us, but it was useful for the Americans. Um, and they didn't disapprove of our engagement with Cuba. Cuba in fact, they found it a, a source of valuable information. I think the same should be true of Canada's presence in other countries with whom uh, the West has difficult relations. So China, Iran, Russia, and so on. Yes, yeah, so I guess funnily enough on the sort of question of Cuba, I remember reading about a story of Pierre Trudeau um, having, what was it, road to Cuba um, from the United States. Um, and soon enough, um, because he'd, put on, he'd been put on the subscription list of um, some communist magazine somewhere, he was um, I think he was initially rejected the visa to the United States in the height of McCarthyism at the time. So, you know, as shown sort of, um, as shown in sort of Canada's history, it does have a history of um, engaging diplomatically. Um, and, you know, even as, a, even as someone who would identify as conservative, I'd say that you know, the Liberal Party of Canada does have a history of, um, dip, of diplomacy of very strong diplomats and very strong leaders from Lester Pearson um, and, Mackenzie King having established Canada's role in the world as a true middle negotiating power, um, as a, if you were the reconciliatory power. Um, and, and, and you know, I, I think it was a bipartisan policy. If you go back um, during the very dark days under Mao in China and the Great Leap Forward, um, the Diefenbaker government, which was conservative, mm -hmm. Uh, opened the door for wheat sales to China, which in many ways rescued millions of Chinese from starvation. Um, the engagement, certainly our relationship with Cuba did not change during, uh, during the uh, cons years of conservative government in Canada. Uh, both Prime Minister Diefenbaker in his time and then certainly Prime Minister Mulroney, were champions of engagement on uh, the apartheid regime in South Africa, uh, at the time taking on Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan in the G7 on that. We always maintained active relationships with the Soviet Union and with many countries in the Soviet bloc uh, during both conservative and liberal regimes. Canada's role in the world has not been isolationist, and it has always been firmly in NATO and the Western Bloc. 
but has always reserved the ability to have communi open communication and dialogue with countries with which we disagreed, as well as those with whom we agree. Understood. And I guess I'm looking at sort of another area, another vital area of external engagement that um, was at the, at the for a period of time important to the Trudeau government in its first term, and now is almost a, a very much vital and interesting question in the United Kingdom is the issue of trade. Um, now, you were, I, I believe you were elected to Parliament in 1988, during a period when the Liberal, then Liberal leader, um, John Turner, was rallying against um, U United States Canada free trade. I think there was an attack ad saying that the United States would erase the Canadian border. Um, so in light of that, um, the Canadian Conservative Party, um, as one of its manifesto commitments, um, has support, chosen to support a Kansas free trade agreement that is an EPA between Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, as all four are economies with similar, um, at similar development stages, which could be seen as compatible from a comparative advantage point of view, uh, among other reasons. And I guess in light of all of that, um, what do you think, what are your thoughts on this proposal? And do you believe it will work um, to the advantage of Canadians? Uh, no, I don't actually. I think it's a poor idea, poorly, poorly uh, conceived idea. First of all, we're already in a trading agreement in TPP with the uh, with Australia and New Zealand. Uh, they were very tough negotiations because, unlike the United Kingdom, which is a different case, um, uh, the Canadian and the the ANZAC, uh, if you could call them that, economies are not uh, complementary, they're very similar. And the negotiation, particularly with New Zealand over dairy issues, <clears throat> was difficult. So why we would want to reopen that, I don't know. Um, with the United Kingdom, of course, we were part of, uh, of the of the comprehensive trade agreement with the European Union and that included the United Kingdom at the time. And so extending the, those provisions so that they apply to the United Kingdom as a standalone entity makes sense. We may even be able to enhance those. Uh, uh, Canadian investment in Europe was already heavily weighted to the United Kingdom. So there's, there's much there and, and, and our economies are not exactly fully complementary, but they are a similar stage of development. And there's not as much overlap as there has been with, uh, with uh, certainly with New Zealand uh, on dairy and with Australia on, on um, mineral extraction. So, so I, you know, I don't, I think, you know, I, as foreign minister, of course, having relations with New Zealand and Australia, in some ways, they were the most like-minded countries that we dealt with because uh, of our systems of government, our traditions uh, emanating from, from a British source in the first place. Uh, so shared values, attitudes, and so on. But from a trade point of view, not as relevant. Um, far away, and as I say, similar kinds of exports rather than complementarity. I would focus, if I were advising Mr. O'Toole, on the United Kingdom. Okay, um, I think that, that sort of makes sense. And I guess actually speaking on, um, on the leader of the opposition himself, um, over the past few days, particularly um, throughout the federal election campaign, there has been a sort of a growing theme um, I don't, uh, within the Conservative Party, um, and something that maybe I guess the Liberal Party might be starting to look at, which is a question of deficits. And I think Mr. O'Toole has committed to um, deficit reduction was it within the next coming 10 years with the ambition of getting to some level of deficit neutra neutrality during that period. Um, and I guess in light of that, as well as your role um, as I think as finance minister um, in the Chrétien government, um, succeeding um, Paul Martin as one of the finance ministers who significantly cut um, the deficit throughout those years. Um, and you obviously sat, obviously sat alongside him in cabinet. Um, do you, how do you believe that the Liberal Party has changed in terms of its approach um, to, to the deficit, um, to spending and to social spending? Um. Well, after, after making commitments around the deficit in the early days, 
um, I, I, I'd say that they've taken license from <clears throat> the COVID um, response to basically put aside any concerns over uh, deficit spending. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it, it has, you know, there's been plenty of justification for running deficits, um, you know, during this phase uh, because of the threat to the economy, as was the case in 08, 09, when we had the, the global financial crisis and it was necessary for governments to spend at that time in Canada was a conservative government that, uh, that, that ended what I guess was 12 years of consecutive surpluses and resumed deficit spending. Never quite got out of it. Uh, nominally did get out of it in the very last year of the Stephen Harper government, but arguably, you could argue whether the numbers really justified saying it was a balanced budget or not. It was, it was a, tight, a tight thing. The Liberals then went back into deficit to some degree, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't think it's so much the budget being balanced as are you allowing your deficit to grow faster than the economy grows over the course of a full cycle of expansion and contraction? It's clearly going to grow faster during a contraction, but then you've got to begin paying it down during the expansion period. And I see no sign of that. I see commitments on spending programs uh, that uh, will not necessarily add to Canada's productivity um, or uh, support economic growth. So I, I'm one that's, that's worried about the trajectory that we are on. Um, at the moment, it appears benign because other countries are in the same situation. But uh, but uh, ultimately, if you finance a government borrowing uh, to too great an extent through a quantitative easing approach, Bank of Canada essentially buying the government bonds, you can't help it, by, in my view, uh, to be debasing the currency. You're allowing your, your, your money supply to grow faster than your economy. And we are seeing signs of, of pretty stubborn inflation, not what we had in the 1980s when it was in double digits, uh, but it starts somewhere. And uh, it's, it's very hard to adjust uh, back. And sometimes it can be very painful when you have to, as we experienced a you know, sharp downturn in the early 90s, largely as a result of the need for monetary policy to to uh, to turn back inflation, so I think these things, you know, they there's been no suspension as far as I'm concerned of the rules of economics. So, so we need to be concerned about uh, a spending trajectory that is not going to be sustainable over the long term, um, and uh, an inflation situation that begins to grow out of control. Understood. Um, well, um, thank you very much, Mr. Manley, for sharing your time today to speak to us, um, to share your valuable insights on, be it what Global Affairs Canada um, ha has had its priority been and what it needs to do in the future um, on Afghanistan and on trade between Canada and the United Kingdom. So thank you very much. My pleasure, Christopher. Thank you. Thank you.